All right, good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming to the hackathon, hackathon Finals. This morning we have the Hackathon Finals. We have six presentations that we're pretty excited about. Our competitors hacked all day Thursday while everybody else was setting up, so it was a little loud, but they got through it. Hackathon is presented by Perform and Ticketmaster, so if we can get a round of applause for our sponsors. Great. So. The hackathon this year is the fifth annual hackathon. Competitors were provided with some data from the WTA, which is the Women's Tennis Association. And to shed a little bit more light on that and the competition, I'll pass it off to Simon from Perform. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, yeah, we were delighted to be able to uh, support the hackathon this year. Um, from a Perform perspective, we uh, work with a number of rights holders and media organizations, teams, et cetera, um, around the world. Um, we've got a long-standing partnership with WTA, uh, and they are uh, some of the most innovative um, and exciting uh, partners that we work with. So it was great to be able to work with them on, uh, on delivering this. Um, we saw some fantastic presentations uh, on Thursday, um, and uh, really looking forward to seeing um, what people deliver during the finals. But now I'm going to hand over to uh, Mike from WTA just to talk a bit more about um, what they're looking for. Thank you, Simon. Good morning, everybody. Um, so at the WTA, our, our goal is to um, use data and video and the fan experience and combine them all together and create some uh, really kind of engaging fan experiences, whatever, which is what everybody's talking about the conference today. So um, the panel or the, um, the uh, participants of the hackathon were charged with taking historical match data, live scoring data, uh, also uh, some historical video, and meshing those things all up together and creating, um, creating some experiences over the course of one day. Uh, as um, as we said before, there were two areas. There's one uh, that we kind of broke the, um, the submissions into a fan engagement area and also into a gamification area. So uh, the six presentations you're going to see are kind of split into those two categories, and I think you'll be impressed with what these people uh, did during that time. And then we'll come back and announce a winner. OK, without further ado. Gonna check the mic. Yeah. Hello. Oh. Cool. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we are uh, Mohammed Amar, Sebastian Fischbach, and Andrew Barris. We're of the Wake Forest MSBA program, and we're gonna be presenting today on what we call other clicker. This one right here. Okay. Green is next slide. Perfect. Okay. So we'll be presenting today on what we call the Warrior Index. So this is a match that happened in the second round of the Indian Wells tournament this past year. We have Johanna Konta against Marketa Vondrusova. And what it looks like kind of initially is an experienced seated player against an unseated, unexperienced player. And kind of from experiences, this is probably going to be a relatively difficult match to market to your more casual fan. Because if you see this as somebody who doesn't understand tennis that well, it kind of looks like the experienced players just kind of roll with this one, kind of maybe blow out the younger player, and that this isn't going to be particularly interesting for your casual fan. So we decided that we were going to look for something that made these kinds of matches more interesting by providing a storyline that marketing departments and fans could get behind, kind of providing an additional element, additional insight into what is going to make this match really interesting. <laughs> So the key idea behind what we did is that we want to bring excitement to individual matchups by empowering the fan to identify with the emotions of a player, particularly in really stressful situations like break, break points when they're holding serve. We wanted to identify, are these players that give in or are these players that rally back? All right, so what makes a warrior? How can we quantify this warrior index? And so we really looked at four factors that were all based off of the Hawkeye data. Uh, the first one, which we gave a weight of about 45%, um, this is the ability to win when you're given the opportunity to break the opponent. 
So can you capitalize on that opportunity? The actual statistic that was used was the ratio of breakpoint win percentage to non-breakpoint win percentage when you're returning. Next one. So then we give a 25% weight to the ability to handle pressure when you have 100% control. And when do you have 100% control when you're serving? So do you double fault under pressure? Do you double fault when the opponent has a break point? We give about a 20% weight to the ability to win when the opponent <coughs> sorry, has a chance to take away the advantage that you have when you're the server. So that's the ratio, um, similar to the, the first one, that's the ratio of the break point win percentage versus non-point non-breakpoint win percentage when you're serving. And then the final one is about 10%, and that's the consistency of serve under duress. So do you stick to your game plan when you have a breakpoint versus when you don't have a breakpoint? Now, if we apply the warrior index and look at the same game that Sebastian was talking about earlier, we can see it from a sort of different point of view as a fan. We can see that Vondrasova has a much higher warrior index than a Kanta, and relative to the tournament, you can also see that her warrior rank is much higher as well. So we can, from this, we can tell that she's going to be really fighting back. She's going to be really rallying hard, and she's going to want to make it a close game. So now, if we look at the match itself and see what happened in the match, we can see that the first set is actually the tightest that it can ever get in tennis. They went to six six on the games, and they had to go to tie break. So you can tell that for a younger player who's less experienced. Wander Sover is going to be very nervous and she's going to be in a very stressful situation. But our Warrior Index tells that she'll be able to handle that stress and really make a comeback. So she came back in that tie break and ended up winning this set. Now if we go to set two, we can see that she actually won by one crucial break point. And Wander Sova really made sure that she capitalized on the second set so she could close out the match. Now this Warrior Index that we developed is very important. It gives fans a chance to engage with the players at an emotional level, and they can tell the player's emotion how they're going to react in these stressful situations. One really important aspect of this worry index is that it's agnostic. So it can be applied to many different platforms. So if you do decide to make an app, you can incorporate this in the app, you can incorporate this in advertisements, billboards, you can incorporate it on the screen, on the TV, as you're watching the game as well. It also brings excitement to lesser known players. So for these lower tier matches earlier in the tournament, most people are not going to want to come. They're going to want to wait for the higher tier matches at the end. So this is going to draw excitement and demand to those types of matches and engage fans in the, in early on in the tournament as well. And then additionally, it'll add insights to fan favorites. So players that are really known by fans, this will help really well known fans who are really into tennis, it'll help them understand those players better and understand when they're going to be fighting back and how much they'll, they'll fight back by. Thank you for listening to our presentation. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Hello, hello, testing. Hi, guys. Um, uh, first of all, thank you to everybody that put this thing on. This was a really fun experience for me. This is my first time doing a hackathon here at the, the Sloan Sports uh, Analytics Conference. Um, uh, I started coming to this conference a long time ago, uh, back when I was in business school and I could get in cheaper. This is my first time as a fully paying adult, which is uh, fun to do and, and fun to kind of come and, and see and participate in this. So this is great. Thanks for giving us this data and doing this stuff. Um, my name is Joe Grimes. Uh, what you need to know about me for this uh, uh, particular conversation is um, I'm a data analyst by day. Uh, I work for an analyst software company, and we, um, I do implementations for them, building kind of the type of stuff that we see here. Um, but my real passion is sports, and, and uh, uh, coaching sports in particular. I'm a football coach. Uh, I coach the um, defensive backs and offensive line for a school up here in Massachusetts. Um, uh, and one of the things, two of the things I'm responsible for that are interesting in this context are collecting the video and organizing our video and marking it up with the plays that we call and the defense that we call and the coverages and the stuff that we do. And the second thing that I do is I'm in charge of the scout team. So I actually help our team prepare. I actually play a little quarterback myself on the scout team because we have a fairly small team. 
Um, so I watch a lot of video, and I'm, I'm really interested in the context of the video and being able to see it and show me every play on third down. What does this team do? How, what does this quarterback do when he rolls right, when he rolls left, when he drops back straight? What's that, that type of stuff? So um, I applied that here uh, in this context. When I first saw this play-by-play -play data, this is a really exciting time for us because we get a lot of really good play-by-play -play data. And what to do with that is really the question. And so in football, we, we do the things I just talked about. What's on third down? When the quarterback does this, when the pass does this, what does that mean? Um, in this context, for the tennis data, I saw all this stuff that we had in the video that we had provided for us, and I thought, oh, this would be another great way to provide that context. So what I'm proposing here is integrating analytics and video for a personalized and interactive fan highlight experience. Said much more simply, this is a way to get your own highlight reel. Like, you don't want to have a highlight reel that, you know, just someone at ESPN put together that just the, you know, here's all the aces, here's all the double faults, you know, here's all the stuff that's interesting. I want to go through and find the stuff that's good for me. What did my favorite player do? What did my favorite player do on second serves? What did my, f what did my favorite player do against all her matches? You know, what, what's that type of stuff? And so I wanted to give the fan an experience using this really cool data that we have and this really good and hi high definition, easy to get to video and see it and look at it and create a personalized interactive experience for those folks. Get your own highlights. So um, I approached this from two angles. The first angle was I wanted to do something with advanced analytics. So as we're taking this data, I wanted to create some tier two, tier three metrics off of this. So those guys that just went talking about that warrior index, I created my own little version of that, but I did it in just like the first hour of the day. It's not really as, it's certainly not as kind of in-depth as what they have, but it, it's this concept of, hold on. It's this concept of kind of a momentum score. And I'll show you this in the actual live thing. I wanted to build a really live, actual working prototype. And I'm just going to show you and explain these things before we see that. This was me trying to do like a, um, like a fan graph type of thing, where you have you know, win probability and be able to see when are the inflection points in the matches. So this is the actual point scored throughout the match. And so if you look right at the top here, let's see if the little laser guy works right there. Uh, that was the final. And so the first set of the final was back and forth, back and forth, points here, points there. And then Osaka really started to pull away in the second set. And so once she won that second set, then she really started to pull away. I think it was 6-2 in the, in the second set. And you can really see just by looking at this graph kind of how that match went. So I did that, graphed them all out, fit a line to it. Again, nothing really complicated given the hackathon time frame. I didn't really want to get too far into the math and spend the whole day just crunching, crunching, crunching. I worked by myself on this. So I drew a line over that, and I did that for every match in the data set that we have, and I'll show it to you in a second. But this is kind of like a win probability thing, okay? That was the first kind of advanced analytic with the data that I tried to pull out of it. Um, this is also annotated and animated and, and really easy to use and interactive. So as you go over each of those bars, you can get some of this data that looks like this. So again, this is all about being interactive and getting the folks, the fans, to actually get into the data and see it, uh, the video and see it, rather. Um, another way to look at it, and this is kind of, again, talking about those guys that just presented, using a, a calculation about, you know, what's happening in the game, when the momentum shifts, when the momentum changes. This one is now just off of the straight score of the match. And so you'll notice, this is again from the final, the orange bar, um, uh, excuse me, the blue bar is Osaka. And so once she won that first set, her opponent's actual um, points scored in the match goes down because once you get to the second set, those games you won in the first don't really matter. So this is just looking at the raw point flow. It's just another way to look at that data. So there's a bunch of different ways we could do it using a bunch of interesting things that are happening at the conference. Some guys are doing a really cool hockey thing in the research papers about getting that momentum score. You could definitely do something more, more intricate with this, uh, but it's a really cool thing. This is going to be a platform pre for presenting these analytics and getting to your video. Okay. Then, the next piece of kind of advanced analytics, I like to visualize this, this X, Y, and Z data we got for all these serves. So I spend a little time kind of building that out. So that's a service down at the bottom, and then that shows when it goes over the net, and then when it goes up to the, um, the actual bouncing spot. This is actually looking at all the double faults for one, uh, one of the players. So you can kind of see where they were going, where they're missing, which side they were going from. So I spend a little time during the contest working that back and forth. Okay. The other thing that was really cool, since we have this XYZ data, we get the fatigue factor. So this is distant, this is distant difference in distance traveled between players throughout the match. So as we're going left to right, beginning of the match to the end of the match, this is saying that Osaka was running less than her opponent. So without getting too detailed, it, it, this is not really complicated math. This is just kind of tracking things over time and adding some columns and some metadata to the data that we had. All right, so these are the advanced analytics I'm trying to use to drive the video experience. Again, these are all annotated, animated. It's interactive, so people can see, ooh, 
This is the actual change in the, the distance scored here. Just again, because it's interesting. And I'm really trying, this is an important thing that I want to do here. I wanted to keep this in the language of regular tennis fans, or the fans that would kind of want a little bit more depth than they have now. I don't want this to be just for the people at this conference, you know, very <coughs> intelligent statistician type folks. I want this to be for everybody. Everybody just to go through and find their highlights. So, you know, keep it in meters, keep it in, you know, things like that. Don't have to go too crazy with it. Show them, you know, different ranges and everything. Okay. So now, finally, this is the actual thing we have here. Um, I'm actually going to show it. This is a video in case it didn't work in the room. So let's see. So let's go to it. Boom. Hopefully this works. Okay, hold on. There we go. That looks nice. Okay, so here's the actual thing here. So that, that kind of momentum index, that thing that I was talking about here, this is where it starts. On this left side, we took every match from the tournament. This is like the tournament view. You know, I want to see what happened at Indian Wells 2018. You come into this, you see all these different matches. You can see, you know, these are blowouts. You know, these are kind of battles that, you know, someone trying to come back after this. You know, there, there's one that kind of back and forth. There's a good one in here. Here's a good one. You know, there was a back and forth here, a good flow throughout the match, but eventually just went that way. You know, so by looking at just that curve, you can get really quickly see where were the good matches. And you know, there's a million ways to calculate what's a good match, but this one's not bad. This is who won each individual point. What's that momentum of winning three points in a row, of winning uh, you know, a whole game, 40 nothing or something like that, uh, 40 love. Uh, so, um, but this is where it gets now interactive. So I want to see, again, we have the video for this match here for the final. So when I click on that, now that brings us into our other analytic pieces. This shows me all the shots all the serves rather that came through and it gives us a lot of kind of interactive pieces. All right, just show me Osaka. Just show me which set, show me which game, show me just our first serves or second serves. This is just looking at faults. Let me just take it all, boom, boom, boom. So you can see that data and it drives you through the process. And now this is the final thing. This is the thing that makes it cool, right here. So when you click on one of these points, it will automatically integrate with the video. So that video just jumped to here. And in theory, this should take you right to this point where you can see that video. So now you have selected by going through this process of seeing what serves you like, what things you want to know about the match. You want to see where the winners came through. You want to see where the, you know, the different parts and pieces all came through. But then it will take you right to that video, integrated in here. Nice HD right in the window. Pop it out. I did it on YouTube, but it could be any type of you know, video service that's just integrated. So now instead of going to a generic highlight or going to some robot-generated highlight or some generic thing you've got to build yourself, you just go, oh, I want to see what happened there. Oh, I want to go down to this match. Boom, 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 boom. Clicking through it and doing that type of thing. So, uh, you know, in, in the time that we had, uh, this was certainly my goal is to try and get something that works. And this works. This is live on the website. Uh, uh, it's quick and dirty. You know, there's certainly places we could go. But all this advanced analytics stuff that it's talking about, about game flow, and every one of these disciplines that we hear today could be applied here. Um, one of these things about which shots matter the most, to highlight them and bring those to the forefront. Awesome application of that could be thrown on top of this. Um, you take this thing and you throw it at some real web developers, some real good design guys, and you're going to have a beautiful tool that comes out of it. I mean, this is why we have the modern technology that we got. So that's all I have. Thank you very much for your attention, especially early in the morning. Any questions? Hi, real fast. What is the uh, the GUI you're using here? Is that Tableau? Uh, would you recommend that for if you were if you were to have more time on this? Kind of like what were the requirements really to when you p were picking your user in interface? So we weren't given any real specific requirements. So specifically, we were told any tool that you had at your disposal, you just had to bring your own laptop. So like I said, my day job, I work with Tableau, I work with Power BI, I work with other kind of visualization, you know, commercial visualization tools like that. So this is what I know. Had I a little bit more time, I probably would have done it more in the native kind of, you know, web-based type of thing. Uh, D3.js is, is, is a tool that I've used a little bit too. That, like I'd really like to make that graph instead of 2D, make that 3D, you know, and kind of do something along those lines. Um, but I picked the one just because of the con condensed time frame, the tools, I knew, the tools I knew to be the best. So I used a little Python script to add some, add some columns to the data and, and do some kind of metadata gathering on that, dumped it into Tableau, and I knew I could get it out and, and make this work. I've done not quite the video thing before, but I've done pretty much everything on the screen I do fairly regularly. So I knew in the, the relatively short period of time that we had that I could get it done. So that was what drove my, my choice more than any particular technology. I said, this is on my laptop, so I did it. <laughs> Cool. Thank you very much.
Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. My name is Andrew Hill. This is Rowan Suresh, and that's Daniel Waldman. And our project is using analytics to turn fan preferences into fan experiences. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I've been lucky enough to go to a couple of professional tennis tournaments, and I found it a bit confusing to navigate the grounds and find a match that was both exciting and also had enough time remaining that it was worth staying at the court. I believe this is a problem for most tennis fans. And also, I'm just one fan out of many where I have my own definition of what's an exciting match and also what's an acceptable time remaining. So how can a tournament accommodate every fan preference? We, we believe that we can give fans that don't necessarily have an analytics background an analytics tool to shape their own experience. This tool will take fan input and return uh, matches that fit their preferences. To build this tool, we created two models. The first model takes Hawkeye player tracking data and estimates the time remaining for each match. On the right, you can see a table of the our estimated time remaining and the actual time remaining for each for a sample of matches at 4.30 p.m. Um, on March 13th, 2018 at Indian Wells. The next model computes an excitement score. We take fan input in the form of preferences and then combine it with Hawkeye player tracking data, and which computes a uh, composite score. The percentile rank of these scores is transformed into an excitement score, scaled from 1 to 100, with 100 being the most exciting. On the right, we have a Monte Carlo simulation of 10,000 fans' preferences uh, and the associated composite scores. Next, Daniel's going to talk more about how we can quantify preferences and input them into our model. So in terms of actually translating what a fan wants to see in, into data, uh, we were able to quantify um, what uh, certain characteristics of the match that a fan might want to see in terms, um, based on the, da the data you see on the left, WTA rankings, median rally length, and turn that into things like star power, rallies, error-free play, and upsets that a fan might want to see or not want to see in, in their Indian Wells or any WTA viewing experience. So to illustrate this example, we have three hypothetical uh, fans who each walk into Indian Wells at 4.30 p.m. on March 13, 2018. Alice, she's a hardcore fan, former collegiate tennis player, big fan of long rallies, close competition, great all-around tennis. On the other hand, Bob, he's a casual fan. He wants to see the biggest stars play, he likes to see the big names, he wants to see matches during the day, high seeds, and he's fine with a dominating game because he just wants to see his favorite players go at it. Daryl, on the other hand, he's a fan. He, he saw that we prompted him to input preferences, and he didn't particularly feel like it. So he's our default fan, Daryl. And we expect that, at least at the beginning, most fans will be somewhat like Daryl. So we want to be able to accommodate their preferences uh, even without knowing them. Yeah, so as Daniel mentioned, uh, Alice is going to input her preferences uh, when she's at the venue, um, looking for a match to go watch at 4.30 p.m. And as we mentioned, Alice really likes uh, close play, long rallies. She doesn't really care about star power. Um, she wants to see great tennis. So these preferences are going to match um, what she wants to see in a match. Um, same thing with Bob. He really values star power, so that's going to be his main play here. And Daryl's going to be left with his default settings, um, and we're going to just present him with some matches without knowing anything about him initially. So these are what, uh, this is what can be recommended to Alice. So as you can see on the left, that's the distribution of composite scores. So for every match available at that time, we're going to give her you know, kind of like a distribution of which matches she's going to enjoy. And as uh, Andrew mentioned, um, the percentile ranking of each of these composite scores is going to translate to her excitement score. So on the right, you can see those are two matches recommended for her with good excitement scores and uh, estimated time remaining. So with this, she can actually make a really cool choice as a fan. She can say, okay, maybe I want to go to a match for only 45 minutes, that's going to be quick. Or, okay, let me go grab a bite to eat for 15 minutes and then hop over to the longer match. So at the venue, this is customizable for the fan. They can get what they want out of their experience. Um, same thing with Bob. As you mentioned, he really values star power, and it's going to present him with going to the Venus Williams match because he's going to be able to see her up close, and he's going to really value that, as opposed to seeing um, a match with, uh, less, uh, with lower ranked players at the time. And this is a distribution for Daryl. He's the default fan, and uh, that's his composite scores. Uh, they, it's a different distribution. And as you can see, the Gabrielova versus Garcia for Daryl is different than the previous recommendation because uh, he's in default settings c compared to uh, uh, customizable settings. So 
What we really love about this framework is that it's incredibly powerful, incredibly flexible, and it puts the fans' experience really front and center. So there's nothing exclusive to being at Indian Wells to wanting to know how much time might be left in a match and how exciting this match might be on a personal level. So for example, you can hypothetically imagine that uh, you're on your couch, you're with your friends, and you input your preferences. You say, okay, we want to see close matches or star power or whatever you want. And then with a streaming library, say there are five matches going on at once, you can choose in a personalized sense which match you want to watch. Additionally, we can add navigation to courts uh, to improve the venue experience. And, uh, but what we really love about this is that this gives us fan input data. It gives the WTA a wealth of fan input data to, say, to, give, to not project what we think the fans want to see, but to actually tell us what the fans want to see. And so this provides huge opportunities for the WTA to further research what the fans actually want to see and to refine the categories, uh, develop further what they, um, a better framework for really uh, getting down to what fans actually want to see. Uh, additionally, we can tack onto the excitement scores more advanced excitement modeling, including live win probability, something that gives them a better sense of what is exact, exactly exciting. So what we really think about, the, and the reason that we went with an approach that, went, that customized fan preferences is that if you think about uh, what, close your eyes for a second and imagine what made you fall in love with your favorite sport. Chances are it's a moment. It's something that made you feel as if you were in something bigger than yourself because you weren't just participating in some kind of mirage of what you thought you were doing. You were actually part of something that was bigger than you. Um, we want to create fan moments, and the best way to create fan moments is not by guessing what we think they want to see, but by asking them what they want to see and finding out. So uh, what we want to do for Indian Wells and for the WTA as a whole is to create fan moments based on fan preferences and to create those fan moments by, uh, uh, by looking to what the fans actually want. So we're all about the fan experience. We want the fan to come in and, uh, and not get a suggestion or uh, that's based on an educated guess, but actually ask the fan fa um, what they want to know and how they can get it. So we think that this framework applies uh, uh, to be able to make the fans, uh, it, or it, we think that the best way to do this is to make the fans uh, have their own their own excitement and their own with their own expectation of how long this match is going to last. And in turn, this will help the fans create a moment that they can remember forever. Because all we have in life is to take the memories that we have with us. And we think that the, the way to make a lifelong connection with the WTA and its fans is to have the fans create the memories for themselves. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah, right there. Hey, thanks for the presentation. Appreciate it. Um, I did have a question about the second two types of fans. Um, would there be any case where there they would be matched with a a game that's that doesn't have like a Venus Williams or a Serena Williams type player? Uh, uh, I can take that, but uh, yeah, so these are just hypothetical games that we, ch we chose four that were going on at the same time, but if there were other options that didn't involve star power, we would still suggest excitement scores and time remainings for every game that's available, and then give them the option to choose what they want to do. Yeah, we, um, during the hackathon, we computed it for the statistics for the input of the model for every match at Indian Wells 2018. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Rob Greenberg. I'm currently a senior at Tufts University. Uh, my name is Abhimanyu Vasish. I'm a master's student at Harvard University. And I'm uh, Antonio Dimitrov, and I'm a senior at the University of Minnesota.
And our project for the hackathon was WTA Call, Your, Call the Shots. We focused solely on the fan experience at a WTA event um, in terms of creating an application, a mobile app, um, that really uh, quantifies gamification. Um, oftentimes, when you go to a big tennis event, um, people are only focused on what's happening in the last set, maybe a deciding point, um, major turning points in games. We wanted to keep fans focused and engaged throughout the entire game, set, and match that they're attending. So the big idea here was sort of pulling from fantasy pick'em style or daily fantasy to basically keep fans focused throughout the entire um, event um, with more micro um, predictions. So instead of betting on, or instead of selecting who you think is going to win an entire match, the entire tournament, um, you're more focused on a game or a set um, to sort of keep that fan engagement throughout. Um, the, some things we came up with were utilizing the Hawkeye data to create metrics that we think the casual fan could really engage with um, and connect with and get them excited about showing up to these events um, and interacting, selecting which, which of their favorite players they expect they're going to win um, on a more micro level to keep that focus, engagement, and excitement really high during the entire event. So our analysis took a couple different routes. The first was to actually look at this Hawkeye data and see what we signed an NDA for. Um, the second was to visualize the Hawkeye data in, in ways that broadcasters could find interesting. On, your, on the right of the screen, you see a visualization of Daria Kasatkina's serve and also a distribution of the semifinalist serve speeds throughout the tournament. And the third thing is to create some metrics and statistics. Now, when we were briefed by the WTA, they said that they really wanted to emphasize the athletic abilities of these players. And when you watch a tennis game, you typically get things like aces, double falls. That doesn't really tell you that these are some of the fastest moving, hardest hitting, fastest serving players in the world. So we wanted to show off these athletic abilities in our application. Uh, some of the key metrics that we came up with, movement ratio, how much you move over how, how much your opponent moves divided by how much you move. Now, this confirms some of our initial thoughts that Simona Halep, who's typically seen as an athletic player, she actually runs a lot more than her opponents do. The second thing is maximum rally count. This really gets, play, this really gets fans excited when they see a long rally. The third is short speed, percent, short speed average. When players hit the ball hard, fans really get excited about a powerful winner. Um, and finally, we take into account the serve as well. We move beyond typical things like aces and double faults, and we look at where, on, where in the service box the serve is being served, how fast is it being served, and finally, the comeback percentage, which is always a, a, a thing that fans love. A couple other visuals that you see, maximum rally count. Kasat Kina actually has played some really long rallies, and we looked at the top three players in the tournament just to see what the short speed is. And Naomi Osaka, she hits the ball really hard. So as we mentioned, this is kind of a, an idea as an app. And in order to kind of show that off, we decided to develop a quick like prototype of an app. So I'll go ahead and show you guys what that is all about right here. Um, so this is a little screen of the phone. This would be kind of our main screen, WTA called the shots as we refer to it. Um, and this is the screen that you see as soon as you click Let's Play. So these are all the current matches that are going on. Again, this is a little bit of a mock-up. Um, but we can swipe through and see all the current ones. So we have Venus Williams and Kasakina. We just have a couple duplicates in here just because of the data that we are provided. Um, so we'll go ahead and go ahead and tap match details. So in the match details here, we can see all the statistics that we were talking about from the Hawkeye data. We wanted to focus in on statistics that really weren't so complicated um, so a casual fan wouldn't be able to keep up with them, but also kind of incorporate a little bit more um, the advanced statistics that the Hawkeye data does provide us. So as we mentioned earlier, stuff such as longest rally really gets the fans going, and that's stuff that people are excited about. Um, average rally count, similar, serve speed, all that kind of stuff. Um, and we have that for both players, Kasakina and Osaka. Um, and then we can go ahead and tap call your shots. So this is kind of the gamification piece of it, right? Um, we have, uh, this allows the ability or gives the ability to the fans to make predictions in real time. So as we can see, this is an example of it being set to currently. Um, and this is the probability of what we think or what the fan thinks will happen in this set. So fastest serve in the set. Um, right now it's set to 75%, 25% for Kasekina. Um, that's a confidence interval. Similar to 538 pick em, if any of you guys are familiar with that. Um, we wanted to set uh, an ability to kind of make predictions, but also 
a little bit more involved than just saying yes or no. Um, so for example, if it was set to 100% and Osaka actually had the fastest serve, you'd lose a lot of points. Um, vice versa, if it was set to 100% and Kasakina did have it, you'd gain a lot of points. And as you can see, the points are right up top. So currently, we just have a mock-up number of 307 and a rank. Obviously, that's a mock-up as well. But that could be similar to something like FanDuel or DraftKings, where, again, keeps the fans engaged at all times and um, keeps them interested in all the little aspects of the game throughout the set, not just for the results of the entire game. And some other features that we didn't get a chance to show in our demo are the player challenge integration. When an umpire makes a dodgy decision during a game, players have a chance to challenge that call. Was that in or was that out? In our app, we give, fa we give fans a chance to vote on that live, whether they think they was in or whether it was out. The second is ticket integration. If you're actually going to watch the Indian Wells game, enter in your ticket number. And if you're top of the leaderboard, you get some really cool prizes, like potentially being able to meet the players. If you're sitting at home watching the game, you could get a signed ball or something like that. And finally, we'd like to talk a little bit about sports betting. We've heard a couple speakers at this, uh, at this conference talk about sports gambling, and we really think that our application has serious implications in that field. With that said, I'd like to thank you for your attention so early in the morning, and we move to any questions. Thank you. All right. All right. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, good morning. I'm Joseph. I'm Chai. I'm Suyoung. And our team sought to really increase the fan engagement piece for the WTA. And so we did that by um, trying to create a concept, right? We were looking at what, what can we do to get the fan more engaged in all aspects of the game. And so we looked to the, um, we looked to the stock market for motivation and created FanCoin, the WTA FanCoin, as a digital currency that motivates fans to buy and sell their favorite players um, and reap the rewards of their performance on the court. We also created the WTA fan app as the platform that houses all of the experiences that go through with the fan coin. Um, and we'll go, we'll go a little bit into how that'll work in a minute. While we were trying to develop the platform and the corresponding currency, we tried creating something that wasn't invasive, something that didn't feel like you were forced to participate when you didn't want to. Um, we kind of wanted the experience to be very personalized so that the user could at all times say, I want more, we'll give you more, um, or this is enough for me, we won't push anything else onto you. Um, we wanted to really target both fans on all sides of the spectrum, so both the avid tennis fan that considers themselves an expert in the sport, as well as the novice who's never picked up a racket. Um, we wanted to target fans at home as well as fans that are watching games in the stadium. And without further ado, this is what we did. And so. This is the home screen of the app. For those of you who trade stocks on the stock market, it should look fairly familiar. Um, the home screen of the app on the top will show you the current state of your portfolio, right? How much fan coin that you have acquired to date um, and how that's doing over time. We also show you in a quick and convenient format what matches are going on right now as a way to encourage you to um, further engage with the WTA. To give you more details about the player, here's the player profile. Right now, we are looking at the winner of the Indian Wells Open, Naomi Osaka. She's worth $230. And how did we come up with this? Well, we have a price mechanism. Um, the, the metrics that we calculated involved strength, speed, spin, agility, and a lot more. Going forward, you can also get to know the news or information or tidbits about that particular player. So all in all, it acts as a, like, like a one-stop shop when it comes to knowing the player. So how did we come up with the player price index? And because we are in the data analytics conference, well, we use the data. 
the base price that we calculated was based on historical information. Say, for example, what is the number of Grand Slams that she won, best rank she has achieved so far, current seed, so on and so forth. But the real juice and the real play happens when you calculate the current price. Uh, and it is made up of a variety of factors. The first one is obvious, which is the demand-supply ratio. That uh, people who know about stocks uh, have some sort of idea that that, is, that, is, that plays a key role in determining the current price. But more importantly, the secondary metrics, such as points per game, momentum, market sentiment, we believe these secondary metrics give you a more accurate and a true reflection of what the player is, or what the quality of that player is. Um, as we can see over here, we came up with much more uh, visualizations. As you scroll uh, down in that app, it will tell you uh, how that player is performing. So here we are seeing Naomi Osaka's player serve bounce profile. Um, here you can, so uh, for example, the aces are th that she scored were generally dead at the center or wide. Uh, the double faults that you see, they, those that are marked in red, uh, they have been weighted based on the speed with which she's playing. So as you can see, if she's trying to hit the ball real hard, it ends up most often going as a double fall. So those are certain nuances or certain insights that we can de derive from the data that we have and we can give it to the user to make a good judgment or an informed judgment uh, whether or not to buy the player. So here's uh, how the dynamic player pricing works. Uh, the game starts, she, uh, she sees one dip in her value because Kasatkina over here wins the point. But going forward, she clamps back, gets the first set, and continues playing with that great uh, accuracy, speed, and performs well and ends up winning Indian Wells 2018. And as you can see, the prices keep on going only in one direction, that is upwards. So this is how data can be used in a very a informative way, and once it comes together, you really see what the potential it has. Uh, going forward, as we mentioned, that we want to make this a uh, truly useful experience, not just for uh, a fanatic, but also for a casual fan or somebody who is novice at this. Uh, once you download the app, the first thing that pops up is to gauge your level of experience or level of expertise. Uh, if, for example, you are a beginner, you can select that. And, one, and if, if you're trying to see the final match, you can see the match statistics, but at the same time, there's a question mark, which can give you a much more insightful uh, uh, information about what is going on. Say, for example, you don't know what's a deuce. Uh, it will give you much information on that. And because this is analytics, we get feedback from the user. Say, for example, have you understood what a, uh, what a deuce means? Do we want us to explain it further? If you say yes, we record that, we take that as a feedback, and we tailor the experience going forward, knowing what you have learned or what you haven't. Um, again, talking about how visualizations can be used to give insights, uh, this is another illustration of how historically these two players have played against each other, helping the user again take a judgment whether or not to buy this player or the other. And so, so far you've seen two ways that you can engage with our application that we've created and the corresponding currency, right? You can buy and sell the players and you can have this assisted match view to help you at all levels of the sport, whether you're a novice or an expert, get the statistics that you're interested in seeing. Um, but we've heard a lot throughout the conference about how nowadays content creation is up through the roof, right? And attention isn't going up too. And so we're constantly competing for the attention of our spans. And so we, we just want to highlight two features that we um, created specifically for this purpose. If you look here, um, pay very close attention to the ball that Kata Skina is going to hit, um, I think now. Great. So the ball landed very close to the line. O ball's called in. Osaka challenges. And if you have our app and we sense that you are in the stadium, what we're going to do is we're going to push a notification to your phone that tells you you have 10 seconds to open the app and vote on whether that challenge was good or bad. Um, by a show of hands, who here thinks that ball is in? And out. Awesome. Looks like out wins. So we're going to go ahead and select out. We have 10 seconds to do that. That's how long Hawkeye takes to, you know, process the, the challenge. As soon as those 10 seconds are up, we see the live review right on the app, whether you're watching this in the stadium or you're watching this at home. Um, and look, we're right um, out. It, the, the ball is out, and so we amass um, fan coin for that, for that participation at no cost to you. 
Uh, second feature, if, if you guys think of all the major sports, right, football has a halftime. During the halftime, there's generally a show. Um, in basketball, they do half-court shots. They bring members from the audience out. Tennis really doesn't have anything like that, and I, I think part of that can be attributed to the fact that in tennis there really is no halftime, right? There's a changeover about approximately every two games, but those changeovers last between 90 to 120 seconds, and so really limits the time that you have. And so what we tried to do is integrate with the app and the fans that we know are in the stadium in order to create an experience that is short, entertaining for the fans that are participating, but also the ones that are watching. And so... In this view, coincidentally, we're one of three randomly selected fans from the stands that have been asked to come down to enter the court and participate. And so the way we do it, we actually generate for you a pass that the attendant can scan in and allow you onto the court. Um, we do this, the changeover, before we intend the actual competition to happen again to um, restrict delays. And this is just one example of what a competition would look like. So in the middle, you see that orange marker. It's a marker that you can just pick up and put down rubber. Um, a lot of people use them for exercise on tennis courts. But basically, you just place it. The, the linesman or whoever's running the competition will place that on one side of the court. The three participants go on the other side of the court. They're given a racket and a ball. And they have one opportunity to try to hit that ball as close to that marker as possible. Using Hawkeye, we track which is the ball that landed closest to that marker and give a prize correspondingly um, th with like a fan coin prize correspondingly to that um, user. Everybody else in the stands gets to watch, the marker's picked up, and the match can continue. Those rings right there don't actually exist on the court. They're being visualized by Hawkeye on the big screen for everybody to see in the stadium. And so set up and take down quick and easy. Likewise, we created a similar experience with bowling, where there's going to be just one marker for you to aim down the doubles alley. Um, the pins aren't actually there, but as you bowl, Hawkeye is going to track your velocity as well as your direction. Um, and on the big screen, you'll actually see how many pins get knocked over. Um, we, we've also incorporated smart voting with the fans. Uh, the fans are currently voting on who they think is going to win and can get um, fan coin based on whether their player wins or does not. And so. We, we don't have time to get into the other three, but for, for just the, the basics of them is, again, we're trying to engage new fans and have older, more experienced fans feel a purpose in the sport. And so we've created chat rooms um, that are tournament specific so that older fans can discuss what's going on in the tournament and newer fans can read and pick that up, as well as Quora-like Q&A forums for specific matches so that newer fans that don't exactly know what's going on and have a specific question they want to ask can be answered by an older um, and more experienced fan. And so you end up with all this fan coin, right? And what can you do? And we like to say that a fan coin is better than a sky mile, right? From your favorite airline. So what can you do with this fan coin? You, you can't cash it out in the way that we've designed it right now, but what you can do is you can purchase at any one of our venues, any WTA venue for a, sport, for a tennis tournament, you can purchase drinks, you can purchase food, you can purchase apparel, merchandise, um, including signed, um, potential meet and greet opportunities with your favorite players. Um, and the one that we really want to emphasize is tickets at a discounted rate so that we can keep you coming back and enjoying more tennis. Um, we really want to thank the sponsors um, and the organizers for this incredible opportunity. And with that, we'd gladly take any questions. No questions. We're good. Thank you. All right, so we're going to go ahead and get started. So uh, we're actually going to be talking about how we can engage fans through surf prediction. 
Uh, and so just to introduce ourselves, uh, my name is Anand. I currently go to the University of Chicago studying economics, computer science, and statistics. Uh, I've done data science at Facebook and Google and uh, actually started a company funded by sports executive Mark Cuban. Hey everyone, Max Liu. I'm on the Chicago men's tennis team and was an analytics fellow at McKinsey. Hey guys, uh, I'm Skylar, not from the same school as them, but from Illinois, so really fortunate to meet these boys. And um, I'm gonna be a data scientist um, and currently doing data science at Tesla. All right, right, really quickly, right before we get started, who here hates waiting for things? All right, me too. Um, so actually, that's one of the biggest problems we've, we've identified in tennis is that only 17.5% of the time are people actually, is the ball actually in play. So most of the time, people are actually just waiting for the ball um, and like picking up the ball, changing sides, um, and fans can lose interest in that time. So you can see in this clip, Osaka's taking around 23 seconds to start hitting this serve again. So we don't have to finish watching this. Um, but anyways, <laughs> we propose to increase fan engagement through serve predictions. So essentially fans can, on their phone, predict and vote for where they think the player's gonna serve next within this time period. So why do we think this is gonna work? First, if anyone in here plays tennis or coaches tennis, you know that the serve is the most important shot in tennis. It is the biggest indicator of how you're playing overall. If you're not serving well, you're not playing well. Second, this allows fans to strategize like a pro. If we present you the, the information, the stats, and given the context of what's going on in this match, the fans can actually enter into the mind of the player and think, given the situation, what would I do? Or what should the pro do to maximize their chances of winning? And it's actually something really cool that you can do if you're a fan of tennis. And lastly, instant validation. A lot of times you calculate stats like, what's the probability of a player winning a game or a set or a match? You need to wait for that to happen. Versus when you predict when and where a serve will be, that's validated almost instantly. And when you have the instant validation, you can be rewarded for being correct and you can compare yourself to the rest of the fans. Was I right? Was I wrong? Was our model for surf prediction right or wrong? And these things can be validated very, very quickly. So now for the fun stuff. We actually have a concept demo. We can follow along actually at this link, maxxliu.com forward slash demo if you want. So leave that up for a second if you want to go to that website. You only have to type in 15 characters. It's not that, <laughs> it's not that bad. So um, we're actually going to dive into this demo here. This is the loading page. So let's say it's the quarterfinals, and you see these four matches, and you say, OK, I want to watch Osaka play. We click on Osaka, and here we provide like all the normal stats that you would see right here. First serve percentage, win percentage of first serves. And here we have the serve quality index. So Skylar will go into this in detail more later. But this will actually help you predict, such as wide, body, and T, what, how strong is their serve in these areas. And for those of you who don't quite uh, play tennis, the reason why we divide it into wide body and T is because actually when you play doubles and you signal to your partner where you're going to serve, you give them a wide body or T signal. And when you, play sig when you play singles, this is actually what you're thinking about. Like, should I serve wide body or T? So given this, we can select, OK, I'm, I think it's going to go into this yellow area here. And now we show you, all right, this is what the rest of the fans think. And this is what our AI model actually thinks. And you can continue to click through the different screens and see the stats and then wait for them to hit the serve. After they hit the serve, let's say it goes in, it gives you this check mark and gives you 100 points for being correct. So yeah, thanks, Mike. Uh, thanks, Max. Um, Max talked a little bit about the SQI. So the motivation that we created this index is we believe that there's going to be a lot of casual fans out there. And fans, um, for this generally new concept, they want to be guided along the process. That we want to give them some information to make their decisions or guesses for each serve on. That's why we created like this holistic index called the Serve Quality Index, which basically takes in how well a player can serve the ball that he or she wants to serve into each zone, and then how well will that ball um, be returned by the opponents. So we take those factors and we created this equation through some discussion. Um, it's by no means uh, it, it is by no means a complete metric, but um, what we're trying to do with this metric is we are trying to see in general how well can a player serve into the three zones we mentioned: T, wide, and body. So this is kind of like a diagram of how Osaka. And uh, Kasakina's serve quality index changed throughout the match. You can see that Osaka served gradually better and better, and then Kasakina did not do so well, and then that ultimately resulted in Osaka's win. So we think like with this index, there could also be a lot of potential comparing with historical data, giving fans something 
easily read readable to understand and inform their decisions. So earlier in the app demo, uh, Max, actually, Max actually mentioned uh, the AI model. So we actually think that presenting an AI model to fans could actually serve as a pretty good benchmark for them to identify what fans think, uh, what our models think, and maybe perhaps what might actually happen just a few seconds later within the game. And so we actually decided to go ahead and uh, play around with some of the data. We decided to do some machine learning. And we actually went ahead and built uh, two main uh, types of uh, tools and one was the random forest classifier, and the second was a recurrent neural network. So on the next slide, uh, we're essentially going to see some of the results that we found. So uh, we went ahead and first trained a random forest classifier, which gave us around 76% accuracy. And then we also trained a recurrent neural network, which was also just a little around 76% accuracy as well. And so you're probably wondering, what is the difference between the random forest classifier and the recurrent neural network at a high level? So the, the random forest classifier actually allows us to classify a given point as uh, where exactly the serve was placed. Was it in the wide section, was it in the body section, or was it in the T section? Um, the recurrent neural network actually allows us to predict what the player will actually do next. Where exactly will they serve next? And so uh, we then went ahead and decided to actually play around with active learning, and we were actually able to increase our accuracy up to 92%. So for any of you statisticians out there, uh, I would definitely recommend looking into active learning, especially if you're working with a small data set, and especially with a data set that's quite unlabeled. Um, and so we actually think that we'd be able to get some of these numbers up, especially in the recurrent neural network, higher as well, if we were given more data. Unfortunately, during the competition, we only had access to about 17,000 points. But assuming we had a lot more information on a lot more tournaments within the WTA, we'd be able to make that number a lot higher as well. So we can go ahead uh, and look at the model demo. Um, and so this is actually going to give you an insight about how exactly the recurrent neural network actually works. So how it works is it actually looks at all the past data to make a prediction about what comes right after. What is the player going to do next? Where is the player going to serve? And so we decided to just pick a random data point within our data set. And within that point, we see that Osaka is currently serving her second serve. It's just a, a couple of games in. And uh, we sort of see that the, the, the previous serve speed was uh, 93 miles an hour. We see that the previous rally length was nine meters, or sorry, uh, nine times. Uh, the previous uh, server distance and receiver distance was just how, many, uh, how much the players ran was just about, uh, both, for both of them was about 30 meters, so they were pretty tired. And so given that this was her second serve, we essentially found that uh, she decided to serve down the tee. And so this actually makes sense because it was a safer serve for her and because she wanted to target Kasatkina's backhand, which was, her weaker, uh, which was her weaker move. And so this was actually what our model predicted, and we were then able to see that this was also what actually happened within the game. So finally, we actually wanted to just get a sense of what everyone thought about this. And so we went ahead and talked to uh, three different schools. We actually talked to several tennis athletes at the University of Chicago, including the Chicago men's tennis coach. We also talked to the Amherst women's tennis team, as well as USC's men's tennis team. And not only did they confirm our initial, uh, what we initially suspected, but they also gave us additional information about the, the fact that the ball is only in play about 70.5% of the game, uh, people hate waiting, and this is a problem that can actually be solved even later this year. Um, and so we think that given this market validation, uh, this is something that people will definitely use, and uh, if they're able to rack up points on their mobile app, they'll definitely be able to get sort of prizes like signed tennis rackets, signed tennis balls, et cetera. And so in conclusion, here's what really matters. People are bored of waiting. And so at the end of the day, if we can give them something that they can engage themselves with just within the 20 to 30 seconds that they have between points, we'll be able to increase engagement within tennis. And given some of the models that we've built using serve predictions and given the serve quality index that we can use as a comparison, as a comparison point, but also as an education point for, uh, for all fans around the world, we think that this idea is truly going to change the game of tennis. And with that, we're open to any questions you might have. Hi, just like a, a two-part question. Um, one, what uh, packages did you use? Hey, here. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, it's fine. Um, what what packages did you use in, in, I'm assuming it was Python if you're using a Jupyter notebook, yeah. um, especially for the, um, particularly for the active learning, um, number one. And number two, uh, slightly a more general question, 
Um, what is your experience with tennis kind of coming in prior to this? Like, were any of you guys tennis players, or were, was all the knowledge that you had about tennis something that you gained from um, using your network? Yeah, that was a great question. So Max actually here is a, is a tennis athlete. Um, he's been playing tennis for a long time. He's actually on the UChicago men's tennis team. Uh, so we were able to tap into that network and, and get that market validation. And with regards to your first question about what packages we used, uh, so for active learning, we used a package called Modal. Uh, it's actually spelled M-O-D and then capital A, capital L. Um, and so I didn't really get into this since we didn't have a lot of time, but why active learning is important is uh, you can essentially select a certain subset of data points to be most informative of uh, how well your model will perform. And so if you can kind of overweight some of those data points, you can actually train your model a lot better. Uh, and we were able to do that given, one, the fact that we had to manually construct our data set ourselves and label everything ourselves, but two, we actually had quite a limited data set. So we were able to increase our test accuracy by a whole lot just by using active learning. And it's, uh, it's actually really simple to use just you know, with 10 to 15 lines of code. Uh, are you referring to accuracy within our, our training models? Yes, yes. Uh, so this was test accuracy. Like so, so we, recall, yeah. What are you talking about there? Sorry? Are you talking about precision recall? What are you talking about with 92%? Yeah, so this was, so we essentially went ahead and, and split our data set into a training set and a testing set. Uh, for some of our models, we actually used five-fold cross-validation as well. Um, so this was just uh, after we went ahead and trained the model, how well did it perform on our testing set? Thank you. All right, that concludes our hackathon finals. Uh, I'd like to say thank you to the six teams who presented today. I think we saw some really interesting stuff. The winner of the hackathon for both the user experience and the gamification categories will be announced tonight at the Alpha Awards ceremony. Thanks everybody for coming.